coming in. We're just going to wait for the Zoom room to fill up. Once we get enough people here in the virtual space, we'll go ahead and launch into our discussion with Peter Ho Davies and Elizabeth McCracken. Thanks all for being here. It's very fun seeing that number click up and up. It, it really is. <laughs> This is why I have to slide my glasses down my nose in order to see the number. <laughs> yes, not been able to get to the opticians for a little while lately. All right, everyone. Welcome. Good evening. I'm Julia, bookseller here at Politics and Prose Bookstore. We are live with Peter Ho Davies and Elizabeth McCracken discussing a lie someone told you about yourself. You can follow the link that will be posted in the chat feature to purchase the book directly from us. If you have a question for Peter or Elizabeth throughout their talk, feel free to drop it in the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions at the last portion of the discussion, though we apologize in advance if we simply run out of time this evening. Before we begin, we really wanna thank all of you out there for joining us. We are so thankful to our family of loyal customers who keep our spirits and our business afloat. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Peter Ho Davies is author of The Fortunes, a New York Times notable book of the year and winner of the Anisfield Wolf Award and the Chichakwa Prize. Elizabeth McCracken is the author of six books, including Bowl Away, Thunderstruck, and Other Stories, winner of the 2014 Story Prize and long listed for the National Book Award, and The Giant's House, a National Book Award finalist. A heartbreaking, soul-bearing novel about the repercussions of choice that will strike a resonant chord with parents everywhere. A lie someone told you about yourself traces the complex consequences of one of the most personal yet public, intimate yet political experiences a family can have. To have a child, and conversely, the decision to not have a child. A first pregnancy is interrupted by test results at once catastrophic and uncertain. A second pregnancy ends in a fraught birth, a beloved child, the purgatory of further tests, and questions that reverberate down the years. When does sorrow turn to shame? When does love become labor? When does chance become choice? When does a diagnosis become destiny? And when does fact become fiction? On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Peter Ho Davies and Elizabeth McCracken. Thank you both. Thanks. Thank you, Julia. Hey, how's it going? Great to see you, Elizabeth. It's really nice to see you. And thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Oh, my, it's my pleasure. It's it's such a gorgeous book. Um, and we talked that maybe we said that maybe you would read a tiny, tiny bit of it. Sure. Yeah, no, I'm happy to do that. Uh, just to give people a little taste yeah. of the prose, but only for maybe a minute or so. Um, you know, as, as Julia's introduction suggested, it's, um, you know, it's a book about parenting but in that weird um way you know on the one hand there's there are these parts of it that i, I assume the trials and tribulations of parenting will be fairly familiar to some people but there's that defamiliarizing start where we start with um the diagnosis and an abortion that the characters go through through the first pregnancy um but i thought i'd read a little bit from the middle of the book where um maybe some of those more familiar um experiences of parenting will ring some bells for people this is after they've um had a child. The father wanders the aisles of babies are us, disheveled and stunned as a refugee from some disaster. He stares blankly at the bales of diapers, the pallets of formula, the piled high bricks of wet wipes. It's the baby industrial complex, the great American toy chest. Serried ranks of cribs like, like a cell block. He recalls some statistic that the average child cost its parents $200,000. Presumably not including that $500 jogging stroller or those night vision baby monitors, though what's another $500 against $200,000? He's gripped with the sudden realization of how reckless it is to be here so tired and desperate with a credit card. He'd give $200,000 right now for a night's sleep. He emerges with a stair gate, outlet covers, locks for their cabinet doors to baby proof their home. Too late, his wife whispers. He's already inside the house. I, I, I love that part. I love the whole book, but I, I feel like that part gives a, a good sense of the strange sort of harmony of dread and humor and, um, and just 
incredible observation that's throughout this book. And the, the book is about, it's about reproductive catastrophe and parenthood. It's also about a writer and a professor of writing. And it is formally really interesting. And I, I told myself that I was gonna try not to get too inside baseball um, about it or, or inside football, as I believe you call it, baseball in the United Kingdom. Um, but I have um, some questions about how the, the book is very self-aware about its form in a way that I found continually surprising and unnerving and also deeply pleasurable. And so I'm absolutely not gonna ask you. So Peter, how much of this book is autobiographical? But I am really interested in the question of how it is to write and then publish a book in which people are gonna ask you how much of this is autobiographical <laughs> and also how, cause this is your, it's your fifth book, right? Yeah. Um, how that feels different to you now than it might've when you were first writing and publishing that, that question of what feels possibly revelatory about yourself or not, or are people wondering? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I appreciate you not asking <laughs> what's fact and what's fiction, um, but you know, that's a rod I've made from my own back. I understand that's a natural question um, for readers to wonder about. And for a while, uh, as is often the case when we're in the midst of a book, um, that was a space of considerable anxiety for me. Often, I think well, we're often caught up uh, as we're writing books about worrying how all this work, how all this hit readers, of course, along the way. And then I find myself at some point um, beginning to write into those problems or into those anxieties or into those doubts in various ways, um, and even maybe to embrace them, I suppose, in some ways. Um, so what dawned on me, I would like to say it dawned on me from the outset, but it dawned on me a little ways into the book, that the the uncertainty that the book, I think, breeds in readers, which is the uncertainty of where fact ends and fiction begins and vice versa, is an analog for the uncertainty the characters are dealing with, essentially a diagnostic uncertainty, right? They get this terrible prenatal test result, they have other test results even after they have a child, um, all of which cause great uncertainty and great anxiety. So there's a way in which the uncertainty of form that I think the book is, um, uh, is leaning into creates a hope for the reader, some version of that uncertainty that the characters are negotiating as they move through that space. Um, so some part of that recognition made me feel like I was a little bit more in control of this, this thing that felt as though I was vulnerable to it. And I, I think I am, of course, still in many ways. Um, it nonetheless felt a little bit more intentional and a little bit as though I've, of course, what I've just done is intellectualize that space, which also made me feel a little bit safer in that sense as well. Um, and then I began having thought into that to think, well, okay, can I use this? Is it one of those fictional judo moves where we use the way the reader's momentum moves in a certain direction to push back and forth in various ways? And so in a sense, uh, in a writerly way, have some fun with them those uncertainties and questions. Um, and then that began to license a whole bunch of other things, right? I mean, we like to do the inside baseball, inside football quality of things, right? We are both teachers, so we do that a lot of the time. Um, we both had a number of books out, so we've been in these spaces where we uh, are interviewed about them or we're talking in bookstores about this. Um, and we're also people who have sat in these audiences and enjoyed that inside baseball stuff as well. So it was fun to sort of do a little of that in the context of the book. Um, the, the slight downside of it, I find, is that um, I worry that when I talk about the book, that it's all spoiler alerts, because I feel as though everything I would say about the book is in the book already in a strange way. So the separation between here it is, and here's how I wrote it, or here it is, and here's how I thought about it as I was writing it, um, some of that that I would uh, imagine to be a, a more... Um, uh, stringent line in the context of other books. It's a much more permeable space with this particular book, I think. That's, that's actually one of the reasons why I, I twisted your arm to read a bit, because I feel like so much of what the book is about is how it's written, and that to try to describe it feels impossible to me. That is, you can describe sort of the elements of it, and it sounds like one sort of book, but that feels not like what the book is to me. Yeah, it, it, it's funny. I mean, I th that description that Julia was reading of the book, um, you know, 
from some of the jacket copy, I had a hand in some of that. But even as I was hearing, I was like, well, wait, that, but it's not, it's funnier than that sound. You know, so it is a, li a little hard, I think, to put one's finger um, on the nature. I mean, it's true, I think, of any book, of course, to summarize it in lots of different ways. Um, but this did feel um, somehow protean as I was writing it. But I think that may have something to do with the subject, right? It's partly um, about a child and the parenting experience. And as we both know, that's an incredibly changeable experience. Not so much in the moment, the days of course seem endless and the same and incredibly dull some of the time. Um, but I think the shock of it is what it does to our sense of time after a few years have passed and we look back and that thing seems incredibly distant. And yet we also remember how intense and immediate it was at the time we were living through it. So there's something about that temporal distortion effect that parenting brings to bear, I think, um, that I wanted to also feed into the book and maybe speaks to that slightly changeable quality to it. It, does, it feels like that's one of the things the book is about. I love there's a, a passage early on that talks about sort of the endless now and, and later on talking about the parents um, not taking picture, enough pictures because that child has been replaced already. And that seems very true. Um, which makes me wonder how get that whole section about that you, that you read and about babyhood feels so vivid to me, but in a way that that I don't necessarily remember about. Right. <laughs> and I right. and I wonder sort of how you got back to that, both thought wise, but also um, even and this is maybe the inside baseball stuff, sort of formally, like what are some of those decisions that you made in the book to make, to try to mimic that sense of the, of the endless now? I mean, some of that, I think, I would like to claim they were decisions. The decision, I suppose, if, if I'm lucky enough, is I recognize, oh, that's working, or that speaks to some part of that experience. I mean, some of this, the early pages, the first chapter or so, um, I can vividly remember writing while uh, I was a young parent and had a young child and you we were snatching moments of time. Oh, there's a 45 minute nap going on. Maybe I can write a paragraph. Um, so something of the form of the book, it's sort of short sections, I think comes out of that. But I think some of it also comes out of that phenomenon you're thinking about and that I feel very strongly as well, that sense of memory. I, I know I was there in that Toys R Us or that Babies R Us, but... Um, how vividly do I recall that? One of the reasons the book is, um, you know, obviously there are parts of the book that are imagined and parts of the back of the book, part of the book that are sort of fictionally reorganized. Those things happen, but I've restructured them or reshaped them for dramatic purposes. But there's also parts of the book that are fictional because I just don't remember or don't trust <laughs> the memory that I have, right? Um, and part of that is also the gaps. It's not just what's in here, but what's left out. It's also contributes to the, the nature of its fictionality, I think. Um, and I, it was an effort sometimes to recall some of those things, right? Um, although I think there's a way in which, um, you know, I didn't actually do this with Babies R Us, I think, although I might have actually even for buying a, a, a baby shower gift for a friend, but you walk it back into some of those box stores that you haven't been in for, in my case now, 12 or 15 years, and uh, the sense memories come back pretty fast, right? Something about the lighting, the echoingness of the halls, uh, the look of uh, bedraggled shock on the faces of those parents, that brings it flooding back. So I, but, so I felt like I had access to moments, which again is probably why the book is told in these sort of short, sharp vignettes. Um, but I'm not sure I could join those moments up very easily. I think that's the thing that seems so magical and sort of weirdly mystical about the experience that I have these um, snapshots, these sort of vivid glimpses of moments, but putting them together, joining them up, joining the dots feels really hard for me to imagine. It's probably one of the reasons why, um, you know, while it was certainly a pleasure to write this book in the short sections, because it felt like, oh, there's a fun bit and there's a fun bit and there's a fun bit. I didn't have to do the, um, does Virginia Woolf have a line about the, you know, the appalling business of realism of just getting from lunch to dinner, and I didn't have to do that, um, which was very pleasant in this case. Um, it's not, I don't think I could have recovered the space between lunch and dinner, right? Just the couple of moments here and there. I, you, you said, and I saw something in your acknowledgements 
that talked about having published part of it in 2012, but that you wrote it when you were a young parent. So I'm, I'm interested in, I guess, it's a long time to be writing a book. No offense, Peter. Sure. Wrote other books in that time. I think it may be fairly quick by my standards, <laughs> actually. Um, you know, but you published two books, but the Welsh Girl and the Fortunes have been. Yeah, I, I, I was finishing the Welsh Girl just about the time I became a parent. It came out maybe a year or two in, and so I think the first chapter of this is about the first thing, and I published it as a story initially that I wrote after I became a parent. Uh, or the first thing at least that I finished um, once I began to recover from the um, the first year or two of that experience, I think. Um, and I thought I was done. I thought that story was about um, the experience of the pregnancy that wasn't, that comes before. Um, and it took me a while. So it's not as if I necessarily shelved what thought like it thought it was going to be, what I thought was going to be a novel project. I just thought the story was the piece. Um, and I was happy to publish it. Um, but I think in a way it stayed with me, obviously in part through parenting inevitably, um, but also because occasionally I would return to the piece. I, I'd read it in a couple of places. The reactions to readings of it felt um, distinct and powerful, both for me as the reader, but also in terms of the audience response in ways that uh, felt unusual in terms of giving readings. It, and it, so it made me think there was maybe something unresolved there to think my way through and continue to think my way through in certain ways. And that was probably true in the context of our lives as well. Did, did you change that first chapter much? Not very much. I think I might have, might have added a section or two to it, but it's pretty much um, what I can remember while we had a babysitter one afternoon walking down to the local coffee shop and sharing with uh, with my wife Lynn for the first time, um, I gave it, it. It feels like a little chicken shit now that I gave it to her in the coffee shop in a public <laughs> space, um, and I think she had a strong and powerful emotional reaction to it, and that also, uh, but also a su really supportive reaction to it. I think that that was really encouraging at, the, at that moment for me as well. It's 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 interesting to me because when I read the book. It, it, it's, in a, it's a different voice than the rest of the book, incredibly effectively. Like it feels, it feels like a, um, this really interesting, I'm not saying that it's not still a really interesting artistic decision, but as I read it, I read it because it's much more in almost sort of a, a fairy tale voice. The, the two characters throughout the book are not named. They're the mother and the father um, and the boy or the baby. Um, and it's also, and so there's so many little narrative decisions that I find really interesting and effective. I think the present tense is has has that feeling of the endless now um, without it feeling like it doesn't have access to levels of history in a way that's beautiful. The not naming the characters, no character has a name until quite late on in the book. Um, and then that the question of names is really interesting. And in that first section, it feels quite, because it's about grief and shame and devastation. It is, it does feel separate in the right way from the, the rest of the book. Yeah, so I think of it now very much as a prologue in some ways. Oh, sorry. I, no, no, go ahead. <laughs> well, no, I, I, you know, I, I do think that's true. And I think there was a, there was, a, I think a, a challenge for a while in moving on from that first section because I I liked what that was doing and I liked the power of that, but it didn't feel like I could sustain that mode. It would almost be unbearable, I think for me, maybe, and also for the reader, sustain that mode precisely or that pitch um, throughout the course of a book. And so there was a while of, um, and maybe I needed that time, that space of time between having written that and returning to the material to create a little bit of wiggle room, I think, along the way. Um, but it also makes me think of, um, uh, I wanted to come back to something you raised earlier we were talking about, which is that sort of odd, or I think seemingly odd combination of, you know, humor and levity and comedy and these sort of darker, bleaker, more challenging things. And, um, you know, it's funny because I, I was thinking, you know, back to your work and in, uh, 
an exact replica. And you talk about those questions actually from the get-go, that question of can one write uh, lightly in some sense about loss? Or can one find a way to negotiate this space? Um, and I, I thought about that quite a bit as I was working my way through this. You know, and there are there are ways in which I think I don't often separate humor and tension because I often think of laughter as a release of that tension. Um, and we've talked a bit about comedy. We've talked about stand-up. We talked about vaudeville. I remember in the past. Um, you know, we have an interest in those spaces. Um, and so there's a way in which in these bleak spaces, a laugh actually seems easier because people are already at such a pitch of tension that the laugh is just such a relief in certain ways. Um, so it feels natural. It feels very human to me as well, I think, in some ways. But I, but I was thinking about and I was looking back at an, an exact replica today that um, you think about in that book, grief and humor, I think, and the kind of the way they speak to each other, bounce off of each other in various ways. I think that's absolutely true. Um, but I was realizing that in some ways, I also think in, in ways that I think this book processed slowly for me, that I also had a, a degree of anger and the humor was somehow related to that space as well, that it was sort of the, um, the outlet for the anger, I think in some ways too. So there's a, uh, that's a tricky thing because it seems a little dark and I haven't really thought about it a lot prior to today, but I do think there's something of that going on in that space too. Well, it's, I mean, you, and you, you write about the main character's anger beautifully and it, it sort of, um, he's, seems like a fairly um, restrained person. And then as the book goes on, there are a couple of periods where he experiences huge rage at, at various things. Um, I'd like to, I've been trying to figure out how to formulate this question. Well, first, I, first I'm gonna ask you um, whether you think of the book as a political book. Oh, I, you know, I do um, with a kind of caveat, right? I think it's inevitable that if one's writing about um, uh, abortion, as I'm doing from the get-go of the book, there's no getting away from that. Um, and eventually writing a little bit about the character sort of uh, volunteering as an escort at a clinic, um, there's room there for a political conversation. And I think there was a certain point at which I was conscious that... Um, while I wanted to talk about an experience that was particular to these characters, it was a very particular experience and I didn't want it to stand for everybody else's experiences. And there's a way in which um, uh, some of the research I did and the fictionalized scenes around the clinic allow for a slightly larger conversation, I think. So there was some intent in that regard and certainly some consciousness that I um, I didn't just want these two characters' experiences to be the, the entirety. So if nothing else, maybe there's a sense in which um, what goes on at the, at the clinic at least suggests that there are many more stories of abortion that could be told. And this book is not capable of telling them all, of course, by any means, but there's a possibility of that. But of course, we all, we live in the times that we live in, right? Um, and it's, you know, there's even a mention, I think, early on in the book about um, the character's experiences after the abortion they go through um, of seeing, you know, bumper stickers out there during an election season. We've just gone through that. Some of us have seen those bumper stickers. Some of them see them outside of election seasons, of course, as well. And so it did feel sort of inevitable. And I think, you know, to come back to that anger that we talked about, maybe some part of the motivation here, because the book is about as its title suggests, you know, drawn from the Anna Eastern in quote, the shame is the, is the lie someone told you about yourself. Um, I, I kept thinking about regret and the way that regret is sort of weaponized in the political space. It's sort of used as a cudgel against people who feel that as if, oh, that means you did the wrong thing. Whereas I think regret seems like just a natural um, means of mourning in this particular context, actually. Um, and so I, I think that there is some of that some of that anger is coming out of that space. But I, to, to the larger question, I suppose I'd like to, I suppose I'd like to hope that it's, it's a political book, but it also recognizes 
the limits of the politics to capture any individual's experience of this. And the politics is part of the problem. It's confining ultimately to think of ourselves as in this box or in that box. Yeah, I think that, I, I, I think that's true. I think it's a political book in the sense that um, politics occur in life, um, which leads me, so those, you and I went to graduate school around the same time. I was a little, a, a couple of years earlier and just recently, I have been thinking about the things that we were taught that were true about fiction from 1988 to 1990, some of which I rejected right away and some of which I actually believed for a while or believed for some people. One of them was in, when I was in graduate school was that fiction should never be political. Um, one, an, another one was always the, the, the exact divorcing of, even if you're writing autobiographical fiction, that you didn't, as, and the, the character in the, in the book sort of plays with this, that you never, it doesn't matter, but you never ask. Um, and another one is that you are not overt about themes, that everything is about description and you don't talk about themes. And this is a book with a theme, it's in the title and it's returned to, and it's a, it's a book that is um, quite overtly um, and beautifully about, about shame, about that particular emotion and how it touches others. Um, and so I'm, I, I'm interested in, in making some of these decisions where they, do you think you would have made them as a young writer? And do you, I get, and I would love to talk as we both are, are teachers of creative writing is, is the main character. Um, do you, how much have you have rejected about things that you thought for a long time and then have changed your mind about? Um, things you tell yourself, but you don't tell your students and, and, and vice versa. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, to talk about the, the thematic address here and yes there is a real self-consciousness to it i think it, it helps uh, in so many ways that the character is in himself uh, so self-conscious and self-conscious of being a writer and being self-conscious of telling a story um so that licenses a certain degree of um uh of frankness uh and self-examination of the language and the choices being made in certain ways but also allows me i think to um to feel as though I'm not exactly beating around the bush, right? That you can just say it. Um, I, I think I came to a realization actually a, a while ago. I was talking to some students about this recently. Um, for me, it was in the context of a um, uh, of some work on the Welsh Girl way back when. There's a moment there, you know, um, what's the image? It, it's what happens on a sheep farm when um, a lamb is orphaned, the mother you dies, uh, and you want to bring this orphan lamb um, to another you. And what you do is you take, uh, you know, you've got a, a mother without a child and a, and a child in the case of the lamb without a mother. And what they would tend to do is they would take a dead lamb that was of the, um, the you, uh, they, they, would, they would want to foster the lamb and they would skin it and they would plaster the skin of the dead lamb on the living orphan lamb and then hope the mother would recognize the scent of this, right? And um, it's a powerful, uh, almost too writerly, poetic, metaphorical image, um, but I loved it and used it. And, uh, but it felt appropriate in that space to have my character who was smart enough to recognize the resonance of it, right? And for her to sort of out that. And I think actually there was a reviewer who uh, suggested that was a little unsubtle to have to explain the image. And I felt, well, it felt also to not explain it would be to treat the character as if she were not as smart as I thought she was. She's entitled to own her own understanding of this particular image in this moment, it seemed to me. Um, and so that's encouraged me since that point to allow characters in books to recognize the meaning of the world around them, I think. Um, it, it may be at the risk of a lack of subtlety, but it also feels as though it's in service to the, an honest service to the nature of those characters. So that, that's one thing I, I think I, I gradually learned actually through my own, um, through my own work, I, I think along the way. Um, and more broadly, you know, the question that I think about and, and think about quite a lot in the context of, I think this book, 
um, but also in the times that we live in, you know, is that idea of write what you know, right? The authority of that, which, you know, we hear a lot and, uh, and I'm sure I promulgated it to some degree myself. And like all these bits of writerly wisdom, you know, they're like old wives tales. They have a certain kernel of truth, right? But there's also a limitation to that. And, you know, the limitations are endless. We could talk about them a great deal because the, the initial sense of it is it, there's a sense of authority, right? I'm telling you this, here's my contract with the reader. Uh, I'd like you to sit down and read this, you know, 20 pages or 200 pages, whatever it might be. And the deal is that I know something about what I'm talking about. Um, and I think I became interested in it over time in the idea that we, I'm resistant to the before and afterness of that, that you write what you know, how you know it, and then you write it. That doesn't seem very interesting to me. And I think I realized after a while, as all of us do intuit, that writing for most of us is thinking, that we write to know, that we write into those spaces. Um, but I think a little bit with this book too, I was recognizing that sometimes we also write about the things that can't be known right? There's a fundamental gap of uncertainty, you know, that I'm interested in from my background as a physicist in certain ways as well, but that is there in the percentages for these characters. Um, and so it felt as though uh, it's not just that Chekhovian idea of it's not our job to provide answers, just to ask the questions, but maybe even to ask questions that are unanswerable seems as though it's partly, partly what we do. And, you know, while it's very particular to these characters, it also feels as though it is in many ways of our moment. Obviously the uncertainties of the pandemic that everybody's experienced, of course, flow into this space. Um, but I think I was thinking about that idea of author and authority. And I think I was just describing the times we live in now as um, what authoritarian curious, right? Which is a slightly <laughs> too gentle way of uh, and comic comedic way of thinking about something that seems deeply serious to me. Um, and wondering how we feel about author authority when we also think of our role as um, to speak truth to power, to be outsiders, to speak back into the centers of um, of authority. I, I'm not sure how to negotiate that exactly, um, but somewhere in the midst of all of this sort of thinking. Uh, etymologically, I suppose, in some ways. Um, I dug back into author and found that I think it's, um, maybe it's Latin sources also include meanings of father and teacher, which for the purposes of this book feel very nice to me in, in a way as well. So not that I knew this in the midst of writing the book, but in one of those nice, fun, uh, you know, post hoc intuitions, it feels sort of right for the book as well. Yeah, and you describe the character as self self conscious, and to me, it feels like the book sort of self aware. In this, really, it 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 knows it's a book. In I don't know that feels almost spoilery, but um, but as it goes well, along, it seems to acquire more knowledge of itself as a book. Yeah, I think that's right. It's funny. I was I was just teaching a class. Um, uh, for my MFA students, mostly a, a class in writerly books, books with writers as protagonists, partly because I know how socially distanced they are and I feel that they, they're losing some part of the kind of informal community of writers just gathering together at a bar after they've had workshop, those kind of things. So I thought this would be a nice um, way of filling that gap a little bit. And so a lot of those texts inevitably are sort of autofictional or metafictional and those two things often for me go hand in hand um, and it was surprising how many of them about a third of the way through go and reader that is the book you're reading now and so I, I thought this move was kind of um, one that I was stumbling into myself but it feels like a a, a not untypical or a typical trait of this kind of work I think. It feels much more Mobius strippy to me your book somehow than and that is the book you are reading now. Um, in a, in, ver in a very pleasing way. Um, do you, I know this is something that has, has changed for me a lot about how you feel the relationship between teaching and writing is. Yeah. Um, you know, in, 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 I think it changes for me every few years actually. Um, you know, I, I think like many of us, there has clearly been a, period in my writing life and it's a cliche that writers in academia complain about um, 
how their teaching takes time from their writing. And, and truthfully, I actually, um, I enjoyed teaching a great deal. Uh, so for me, the complaint is more about how, um, and, and I know you sympathize with this as well, how the bureaucracy of academia takes time away from my writing. Um, you know, the parts of directing programs or administration that feel like they are natural extensions of teaching, serving students, I, I'm very down with. Um, and every so often there are parts of it that feel a little too um, bureaucratic that I'm somewhat less uh, uh, simpatico with, I think. Um, but I realized over the last, um, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, 10 years, certainly through the writing of the last book, The Fortunes, and partly because these books take me a certain amount of time, um, that the teaching, the academic life allows me to take the time I need to take with books. I have to get stuck with them, I have to figure them out. They wouldn't be the books they were if I wrote them um, twice as fast, I think in many ways. So I think I've come to the other side of that equation where it feels as though um, I'm being granted a space that might take some time from me immediately, but that slowing me down might actually contribute to the nature of the way the books are formed for me in some way. That's so interesting. Do they feel do they feel like separate practices to you, teaching and and writing? Not exactly. Um, I mean, again, this is a quite a teacherly book, I think, in some ways. And I, you know, I have a craft book coming out at the end of the year as well. Oh, you do? Writing, oh, okay. Yeah, I have a little book on on revision coming out that was fun to write. Um, and and I was working a little bit on the two of these simultaneously. So there's probably some odd in ways that I haven't quite negotiated yet, some Venn diagram overlap between those two spaces. Um, it's certainly been true, I think, in my experience that um, I'm a better teacher when I'm writing, even though there's this tension that sometimes the teaching takes away from the writing time. So it does feel like there's almost a, um, you know, I used to feel like I, there were moments when I felt like I taught in order to write. So the teaching is to make a living, to make time for the writing. And there have also been times when I felt as though I wrote in order to teach because the writing centered me in ways that allowed me to be, I think, a more effective and useful teacher to my students as well. Um, none of this is to arrive at a particular definition of this or even a settled place of it, but it feels as though there's a kind of pendulum swing that I'm describing, I suppose. It, it moves around at various times. And, and maybe the thing uh, that I'm learning to do is that if the pendulum is swinging, maybe in the direction that I don't want to remind myself that it'll swing back the other way at some point as well and try and get used to the, the seasons of the, the academic and the writing life, maybe? Mm. I have, I'm gonna ask you one more question then I'm gonna to go to questions that people have posted. Oh, sure. Um, which is, you've written novels, you've written short stories. <laughs> and, um, and this is a very short novel, um, which is when I, I'm, I'm obsessed with very short novels. Um, I remember I was talking about this years ago. You had a, you had a plan at one point to write a novel in a month, in a year, something that seemed remarkably fantastic to me and, and I envied deeply. I, I once wrote a novel in five weeks that was very, very bad. Um, this was years and years ago. Um, but I have since drafted something in, not in a month, but in some, in a few months. Um, and I'm still trying to decide whether that was a good idea or not. But I'm interested like in So Long, See You Tomorrow or Maud Martha or, um, these, you know, and this is, I think it's, um, must be about 40,000 words. Is Probably that right? a little bit less. I do um, remember a phase in the writing, um, and my editor might be out there in the audience, and I really appreciated the patience uh, the folks at the publishing house had of it creeping up slowly from, you know, a little shy of 30 and like saying, well, you need to get to about 35 and just it, it accreting and accumulating slowly over the months in hundred word increments and sections um, to build back up into that space that felt as though it would be viable novelistically. So do you, do you have a sense of how long something's gonna be when you start it? Do you, is there a real division between this is a short story, this is a short novel, this is, this is um, something like The Fortunes, which is built out of pieces, um, or The Welsh Girl, which is a continuous and, and longer narrative. Um, I wish I did have that sense. Um, with The Welsh Girl, you know, that book 
you know, that was more or less a year or two at the end of World War II, but there was a plan initially when writing it that it would stretch up to the 1980s. And after I had about 500 pages and it was still 1945, I thought, oh, this plan is not probably going to work to get to the 1980s. Um, and the fortunes, uh, well, I'm really happy with the way that book turned out. Initially, the very first section of that book was supposed to be the book. It just uh, changed on me, the character sort of I think the main character in that section declined to be a heroic novelistic character at an important point for him in that narrative. He sort of said, I will step out of the lens of history at that particular moment. Um, so I had to work my way around to other structures. You know, I, um, I, I feel as though I am a novelist uh, slightly reluctantly. Uh, although I'm, I'm growing <laughs> fonder of the form. Um, and in fact, I must admit, I now feel like it's a while since I've written a story and I have great envy for you because you're a wonderful novelist and you're coming back wonderfully to stories as well. The new one is coming out in, in April when yes. the Sydney Museum. Yeah, and I think you do that amazingly. And I was suddenly thinking, oh, I should do that again. But I feel like I've... Um, the story writing metabolism, I'm a little out of training for that in some ways. I need to think my way back into that space. Um, and with this last one, you know, begins as a story. And I think, again, I was super grateful to my editors for this. Um, I, I was under contract to write a collection. I said, I'm working on this thing. It may get a little bit longer. Maybe it'll be a novella that'll show up in the collection. Um, and I just don't quite know where it's going to go. And they gave me... Um, all the rope in the world. And I was really grateful for that. Uh, their patience, um, their willingness to see where it might go uh, and their trust in that process. You know, they, I've been blessed by having editors who generally are more trusting in my process than I am. And that's been an enormous gift down the years and then through several editors actually. Um, but I think it's been a consistent uh, uh, quality in all of them um, that gave me the room to sort of explore into this territory. I like the enough rope because usually that's to hang yourself. Up. Yes, right. Well, it felt like that we might get to that point, right? It did feel that that was the risk being um, being undertaken. Um, uh, and, and who knows? Maybe I do in some ways, but um, but I ended up feeling as though uh, the the risk ended up being worthwhile. Um, well, it's a it's it's such a gorgeous book, um, and I'm going to ask you some questions. If people have questions, please pop them into the Q and A section, um, and I will ask them for you. Well, thank you. Um, the first is from Peter. Question on craft: How do you think you've grown as a writer from the first book to this book? Any difficulty from before that you have more confidence doing now? Any strengths have gotten stronger? Any weaknesses you're still dealing with? Or oh. I'm going to add, or weaknesses that you've acquired. <laughs> That's a great way of putting it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would like to think I've acquired weaknesses, actually, right? Because I think the books, um, I think the books that I really love and admire don't feel like they're great because they're flawless, but because they rise above their flaws in some ways. I, I, I'm always interested in, in that sort of negotiation. Um, it, it, what's difficult, I think, in that question, although it's a very good one, is that I feel as though the strengths and weaknesses asked or revealed of me um, are different with every book and every story almost, right? That um, I would love to think there was a nice sort of ascending line of developing skills and developing practice and becoming better and better at doing this thing. Um, but I think and I think I felt this very particularly writing stories where I sort of leaned into the idea that each story could do a different thing. And it felt as if that was exciting, but also a great release because it didn't mean that I had to compare the new story to the old story, which can be sort of a trap for us a lot of the time. Um, but I like the idea of trying to do a different thing with each project. Um, and that's exciting to me. And also, um, feels like a terrible curse to bring upon oneself because it means that the challenge of the next project is not a challenge you faced previously. So I think in the middle of the, um, in The Fortunes, the last novel, uh, which is a very different book from The Welsh Girl, I think in many ways, um, there did come a point in the middle of The Fortunes where I thought, oh shit, I will never finish this. This is just impossible. I can't write this book. Um, and 
the one thing that sustained me through that moment is that I had been in that slough of despond while writing The Welsh Girl for completely different reasons. But just knowing I was absolutely at rock bottom and didn't think I could go on um, and oh, look, here I am again was helpful second time around. So is that a lesson or is that just a a glimpse of despair that we have overcome in some ways. Maybe that's that's the learning experience. It's not a very um, edifying one, I suspect. It's kind of an efficiency. Yeah. Do you do you think that you've changed as a? I mean, because your books are in fact all quite different. Even um, Equal Love and the Ugliest House in the World feel like feel different to me in really interesting ways. Different sorts of stories. Do you, um, do you have a sense of yourself changing or is it that a, is it a deliberate, a de giving yourself a deliberately different assignment or? It, it's, it's less calculated than that. Um, but I, it's funny at, at a moment like this, what I find myself doing more is less thinking about the changes, um, but thinking a little bit more about the echoes and the callbacks, right? So I'm writing a book about parenting here and um, good Lord, was it 20 years ago? Yeah, about 20 years ago, I published Equal Love, which is a collection of short stories that deal with the parental child relationship. I didn't have a child at that point. It was one of those books you write to anticipate anxieties and lean into those anxieties. Um, and I think, I think I've joked somewhere else. Uh, oh, this book contains, this new one contains lots of the anxieties that I didn't even think to think about or imagine when I was kind of rehearsing for being a parent in the context of Equal Love. But even further back than that, um, the slightly sectional structure of the title story of Ugliest House in the World feels like it's being revisited here somewhat and does yeah. actually crop up again in the fortunes yeah. in a strange way. Um, and I can think about the very first, um, I was gonna say grown up story that I wrote. Uh, that may not be the fairest description. Um, when I was 18, up to that point, I'd written nothing but really bad soap opera, uh, space opera, actually. Um, uh, not that science fiction is a bad genre, I was just terrible at it and had very low ambitions for myself in that space. Um, and I wrote a story about my family's experience of my grandmother's dementia. Um, and it ended up being the very first story that I published, although it's not in any of the books. Um, and that feels like it was also very drawn from life. It was that negotiation of fiction and uh, lived experience. And I think it was oddly the recognition of the power, uh, un unlike in my space opera, that writing about something that was meaningful emotionally to me and my family, um, that that's one of the things that drew me onto the path of being a writer and sabotaged my then fledgling physics career, as it turned out. So there's an odd way in which this feels like it's calling back to those odd roots and so I'm well I'm sure there are many ways in which it's extremely different from what's gone on in the past um for some reason lately I've been thinking more about the threads that run through all the work in some ways interesting we have another question did you in some way from Deborah did you in some way wrestle with the politics of abortion yeah, I, I very much so. I mean, we've used the word shame and the word regret, and I've begun to talk a little bit about the ways that um, those words and sentiments and feelings which you feel are very human get sort of sucked into the more of the politics. Um, to express regret about one's one abortion feels like it's going to be weaponized by one side, but also feels like a betrayal of the other side, I think, in certain ways as well. Um, and I wanted to try and carve out some space for that. Even to talk about shame and abortion feels, I think, like a betrayal of an essential right. It shouldn't be shameful. I, and I, people who don't feel that, I absolutely have got all power to them. I, that's great. That's kind of wonderful. Um, but I think I was, so I think I was trying to negotiate the shame. There's a line in the book where the character talks about being ashamed of his own shame. Uh, and I think I felt that for a long time in the book is sort of a negotiation with that. I, you know, ultimately, I do think there's a way in which, um, in a really strange way, um, the book pivots from, uh, uh, you know, another line in there is the two characters sort of toast each other and say, fuck shame at one point. Um, but there's an almost immediate pivot to a kind of embracing of shame as a kind of human quality. 
um, going back to the Garden of Eden, I suppose, in certain ways. Um, so in an odd way, I, I think my characters begin to feel maybe not proud of their shame, but to recognize it as a human quality. And I think, again, that feels political to me as well, in the sense that I feel that there's a lot of shamelessness loose in the country. Um, people who would shame others for who they are seem to feel very little shame for what they do. Um, and so those distinctions seem interesting to me and feel like they reverberate with the political moment. And I thought about them quite a bit. Um, you know, and some of those things are more or less explicit in the book. Some of them, I, I think, readers will will fill the gaps in as well. Um, what are some of the writer at center the center books that you include in your course? That's from. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, you know, I've done a few that are really interesting to me. The obvious, you know, uh, do some. Um, Rachel Cusk, um, I love teaching Sigrid Nunez as the friend, um, which is a fantastic book in that context. Um, a friend of ours, um, Zachary Lazar, I teach a book of his called, uh, you know, uh, called Vengeance, which I think is really interesting and feels very rightly in these regards as well. Uh, John Edgar Weidman's Writing to Save a Life is a wonderful book in that context as well. So it was a really interesting um, set of books to think about. Um, Toby Wolf's Old Schools in that space as well. Uh, Susan Choi's um, uh, trust exercise was in that narrative as well for me. Um, and so it was really fun putting that course together. It felt a little by like uh, assembling um, an impossibly large anthology of really interestingly books that spoke to each other and, and, and bounced off each other. Nicholson Baker's The Anthologist was a fun one in there, which I think I, I, I assigned a couple of them at least, I think Nick's was one of them, I signed around the election because I thought that that's a fun, funny book. And not only that, of course, it's got many other things going on, but I thought um, maybe in the midst of the stress of that, um, it would be a nice release for people. Um, uh, although I should have anticipated the fact that, of course, you know, the stress of the election would go on for you know, at least a week, if not longer, and maybe had a whole semester worth of books like that. I do feel like that Nicholson Baker is very who's one of my favorites, is very comforting in the notion that you can think through and organize anything. Like right. you can just observe it and it will, and take it down to its parts. Yeah, and the anthologist is really, it's a wonderful writerly book because it's essentially about a character who is struggling to write something and is avoiding the writing all the way through. And I think um, that is heartening for me and I hope was heartening for the students as well. Um, from Patty, Thank you both for an interesting, I'm just reading these out loud. Um, as you can tell, an interesting and inspiring conversation. I'm excited about Peter's upcoming book on revision. Are there any sneak previews, i.e. will any of it be published as articles before the book comes out? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it possibly, yeah, I, I think we haven't quite got around to that point, but it began as a, um, as a talk I gave at a writing conference. Um, and I could easily imagine a sort of, um, a version of that showing up as an article somewhere a little nearer the time. I think the book is scheduled um, with Grey Wolf in November. Um, and so maybe a little bit in advance of that in the fall, there'll be some of those pieces um, popping up along the way possibly. Is this part of their Art of series? Yes, it's their Art of uh, Fiction or Art of Writing series. Although um, I don't exactly know how I feel about this. Um, I believe it is going to be the last one in the series. Um, <laughs> and maybe maybe the art of revision and, and the fact that it's subtitled The Last Word <laughs> feels <laughs> appropriate in that regard. Um, I think I'm honored, I think, to be at the end of a line of very distinguished books, in my opinion, although I feel as a reader a little sad that that series is coming to an end, although I'm sure they they will plan to continue to publish. They, they've got a strong record of publishing in those sort of craft areas, and I imagine they'll continue to do that. It's it's sad, but I also, there's something very pleasing to think about this, that they're not coming up with extra things to think about and to see those beautiful little books on a shelf and going, I have all of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a nice completist set, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm only just, yeah, picturing how my bookshelves are gonna look nice with them, but I, that they're, they're, if people um, don't know um, the art of series from Grey Wolf, it's just wonderful little little books on different aspects of writing by by and it's been really nice to work on it partly because um 
you know, Charlie Baxter, I think is a series editor there, was a real mentor of mine when I first started teaching here at Michigan. And my current editor there, Steve Woodward, is a former student of mine. So there's a lovely kind of um, multi-generational element to that book. And I've, it's been a real pleasure to work on that. Well, I look forward to it. Um, Rhoda asks, you've addressed this in a way, but how um, does your stage of life and multiculturalism, including your scientific background, affect what you write about and how you approach it? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that's something I've um, thought about a lot in various books. I think in the fortunes where I was thinking about um, what I'm now going to describe as my Asian Americanness, I have a, a slight pause because I, I, I've only recently taken American citizenship. Um, and so I, I, I was always Anglo-Asian-ness seemed like the other thing I was going to think into was Sino-Celticness, I don't know. Um, but that multiculturalism at least. Um, but I thought a lot in that book about uh, hyphenated identity and the feeling of the anxiety that you have to choose one side or the other of the hyphen and the fact that we can and should lean into both of these things and claim both of these identities, that the hybridity feels really important to me. Um, and there was a real pleasure in writing that book in sort of coming to a more uh, settled sense of my own identity through that writing process. Um, and that ties back into, um, Oh, have we lost Elizabeth, possibly? I'll keep going. Hope she'll be able to rejoin us in a minute. Um, that ties back into the ways I think about... Hey, Julia. Hi, I, I just came in because just to make sure. Oh, right, yeah. Um, well, but please finish, maybe, yeah. Okay, well, I will I will finish the thought about, um, about bothness because uh, mm -hmm. I think that's somewhere coming also out of my odd physics background. Um, you know, the, the wave particle duality, you know, a fairly familiar concept now to us. Uh, but I think when I was studying physics many years ago as an undergraduate, it really blew my mind. It's almost the only thing I still remember uh, from my days as a physicist. But that idea that two apparently mutually exclusive ideas mm -hmm. can nonetheless describe the same thing, um, that felt very important. Again, makes me think about that question of bothness. And I think there's some of that going on even in this new book, I mean, a lot of these questions go back to questions of identity. Um, and having thought about multicultural identity, I think this book is also thinking into um, gender and identity. I think it's thinking about maleness in some form or other. It's thinking about parental identities, all those kind of questions. So Elizabeth, you didn't miss much. It was just a small, you know, just, just a beat along the way. Oh, is she, are you, she's maybe frozen again though, I think. This is an exciting time we're all living in. You never know what's going to happen. Um, maybe Elizabeth will rejoin us or hopefully she can hear us and tell us. Um, we here at Politics and Prose do have a final question that we like to ask of our authors, which is, um, what are you reading at the moment? There's Elizabeth, maybe. Sorry about yes. that. No, no, no. We got her. Elizabeth and I want to reassure you, you <laughs> froze, but in a in a, in a a very nice Very pose. attractive. It was, oh, I, I, I freeze and I went, you know, and it's horrible. But that was a very, you know, you will, would not be un, un, unhappy about the frozen pose. Um, and I was just asking our politics and prose um, final question to our authors and moderators, which is, what are you currently reading um, in your daily lives or would like to suggest? Um, other than, of course, a lie someone told you about yourself. <laughs> uh, do you want to go first, Elizabeth? I, I, I'm easy. I'm try, I, at the moment, I'm reading a bunch of stuff for work. So it's good, but I'm trying to think of the, the uh, and, I, and I just reread a lie someone told you about yourself. Um, what are you reading, Peter? It's always a tough question, and I, the, 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 the on the spotness of that question, it always feels like thousands of all the books I'm thinking about fly immediately out of my head. But luckily, partly because I was warned, um, I brought a prop. Uh, so I'm, I'm in the middle of reading my friend uh, Kirsten Valdez's ah. crazy, crazy, the, the Five uh, Wounds, um, which I think is not out until um, uh, until April. Uh, and I've only sort of just begun it. I'm, I'm not going to show you where my bookmark is because I'm not that far in yet. I'm, and I worry that work reading, Elizabeth, um, is also about to descend on me. Um, 
but this book is so good that even in the midst of the insanity we've been seeing on our television screens um, over the last few days, um, this was a great refuge. It actually uh, took me away from that for a while, distracted me, um, eased me a little bit into a different fictional space. And um, that says something about the spell that I think it's, mm -hmm. it's going to cast, and I'm really looking forward to reading it. Yeah, that's, yeah. I, I have, I'm, 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 I'm judging a book contest, and... The books are all great. And I was like, I've read all of those books, but I don't feel like one should single one out. To say. Right. <laughs> but I have been reading the Celia Paul memoir, which is wonderful. Well, thank you both for that. Um, and many thanks to our audience out there. Um, Peter Ho Davies, Elizabeth McCracken. Um, the book is A Lie Someone Told You About Yourself. Again, you can get that by following the link that's posted in the chat or by going to politics-pros.com. While you're there, we really hope you'll check out other things we've got scheduled in January and February. It's gonna be an exciting um, end of winter and hopefully spring sometime soon. Um, again, from one bookseller to all readers out there, we hope you are out there staying strong, safe and well-read. We'll see you next time, everyone. Have a good one. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, everybody, for coming.